You're checking out the Investor Shed Podcast with Nick Beveridge and Jeremy Kitchen. They're on the path to financial freedom and they're taking their community with them. Stay tuned for the best free real estate investing advice on the internet. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Investor Shed Podcast. I am the co-host of the hour, Jeremy Kitchen, here with my host, Nicholas Beveridge. How are we doing today, Nick? Doing fantastic again. It is Monday morning. I'm ready to rock it. I am a little bit sweaty. Our guest today, he got me a little sweaty. How about you? Yeah, definitely sweaty from the lights and nothing else. (laughs) But uh, speaking of sweaty, though, we do have Matt Sorensen on the podcast today. Matt was such a great guest. Nick, you want to talk about it a little bit? Yeah, dude, this guy's a player. Um, Mm -hmm. He uh, he manages over $1.5 billion in assets or something like that. A lot of zeros. Yeah. So this guy, high-end guest, um, you're going to love what he has to say about IRAs, self-directed IRAs. He actually wrote the book on self-directed IRAs, didn't he? Mm-hmm. Called the Directed IRA Handbook. He'll go into that in the in the episode, and there will be show notes underneath as well. Uh, great stuff. Great guest. Uh, I'm, I'm excited for you guys to listen to this one for sure. Yeah. And if y'all want to know how much money I make, we get into my personal situation and uh, we just we just go into a scenario of uh, why I should get a self-directed IRA. <laughs> so, it was pretty cool. I thought that was, it was really cool. The thing I liked about that too is obviously he provided a ton of value, but if you want to get free advice from an attorney, get them on your podcast. That's all you got to do. <laughs> That's all you got to do. <laughs> the best attorney in the country. Yeah, when right? It comes it's to so stuff. good. Just get them on your podcast and then just ask away. <laughs> mm-hmm. Anyway, what kind of food should we be eating for this episode, Nick? You know what? I want everybody to fast today because you ate a little too much yesterday, didn't you? You did. Just a little bit. Yep. Yeah. Take a break. You're going to love your break. I guarantee it. Check out this episode. Bye. All right. Welcome back to the Investor Shed Podcast. Nick Beveridge here with my co-host, Jeremy Kitchen. Good morning. Top of the morning to you, Nick Beveridge. How are we doing today? Doing awesome. Good. It's Monday morning. I'm ready Good. to go. I'm loving it. Let's make it happen. I'm really stoked to have this guest on, honestly. Like, I, I know a little bit of background on him. Um, Matt Sorensen with uh, Directed IRA is here, and he's our guest on the Investor Shed. Matt, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, my pleasure. Absolutely, man. Yeah. Really cool to have you here. Um, just for a little bit of background, why don't you uh, tell us a little bit about yourself and um, what kind of business ventures you've uh, been up to? Yeah, sure. So um, I'm CEO of Directed IRA, a company I founded about four years ago. We're at about almost we're about 1.4 billion in assets, almost one and a half billion. Um, adding, you know, sometimes 40 new accounts a day. We're uh, growing quickly, but most of our customers are using their IRA or 401k funds to invest in real estate. That's probably mm-hmm. the most common asset someone will do a quote unquote self-directed IRA with. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's, that's what I'm doing every day here. I also got a law firm, KQS lawyers, 70 plus employees helping clients across the country from tax and legal planning. Um, but I invest in real estate myself. You know, I got a hundred plus employees. I'm an entrepreneur, you know, love that life and, and, um, chasing my dreams still, you know, with mm-hmm. the entrepreneurial life. But, um, that's a little bit about me. You know, I'm just, uh, doing what I talk about actually. So, you know, one I, one of the things that a lot of people are out there do this, do that. I'm like, no, do you do it? No. Okay. <laughs> I self direct my own IRA. Yep. My retirement yeah. accounts own real estate and done private lending. You know, so like the stuff that our clients are doing every day is actually what I'm doing too. Nice. Yeah. All right. That's quite an introduction. Can we go? Can we go back? What? How did it all start? Like, um, I we're gonna obviously get in the minutia of self directed <laughs> IRAs, which. Maybe you're sick of talking about, but <laughs> nah, I love it. Actually, I do. I love it, and that's okay. That's good. Yeah, yeah, cool. And and we will trust me. We'll get into it. But um, how do you get to be a Matt? Um, <laughs> yeah. And like, how do you get to be where you are with a hundred employees and and um, doing what you do and managing over a billion dollars in assets? Where did where did it all start for you? If you don't mind going way back. So you know, I was just an attorney. This is back in two thousand six, and. Yeah had a client that was wanting to buy real estate with their IRA. I'd never Mm -hmm. even heard about it. Wasn't on the bar exam, wasn't in law school, never even heard about it. I worked for a financial services company in law school even too. Mm -hmm. Never even heard that it existed. So um, once I started learning about it, I'm like, oh, you actually can do this. And then I was on the web realizing everyone talking about it doesn't know what they're talking about. And some people were pretty clear we don't know what we're talking about. Go talk to your lawyer or CPA. We just know you can do it. And other people were like, no, we know everything. And they're usually selling you something. 
But yeah. um, I realized there was nobody that was an expert in the field on this. Like really, there was nobody that had solidified, I'm the expert on this in the industry. There was no professional, no CPA, no attorney. Um, and I just like the idea that you could use your IRA to invest off Wall Street. Mm-hmm. You know, I like that you can invest in small business and real estate. And those are the things I was helping my clients with just on a day-to-day basis, small business owners, real estate investors. So I knew it was something my, our clientele would like. So, um, I just dove into it and I tried to learn everything I could. I started speaking at everything I could. Um, I'd get, get presentations like realtors at first. I mean, like doing continuing ed and talking about this and, then I got onto conferences and the speaking circuit. But then I wrote my book, the self-directed IRA handbook. I was like looking around here if you're watching on the video, where's my book? But you know, it sold 40,000 copies. It's the number one book on self-directed IRAs. It took me about four years to write though. The reason it's been successful is because it's content rich. There's nothing else out there like it. So once I wrote the book, the National Association in my industry used, it, used its book for their professional certification training program. Um, half the companies use my book and they buy it in bulk from me to train their employees. Like my competitors buy my book. I even put the name directed IRA on the front cover right. of it and they still <laughs> buy it to train their employees. So, um, the book really helps solidify me as an expert. And I think for anybody from a business venture standpoint is, you know, I looked at self-directed IRAs as a growing area. Mm-hmm. You know, there's more and more money going into retirement accounts. There's $35 trillion in U.S. retirement accounts now. This is like there's no more money anywhere to invest in anything, and it's doubled in the last seven years. Um, so I knew there was money to be made there because <laughs> you know, sure, follow the yeah. money first. It was a growing area because most people self-direct their IRA because they're rolling over out of a corporate job. There's more mm-hmm. and more people able to roll over. Um, now half of the money in IRA – sorry, in the retirement account – space is actually IRA money. A lot of people think most of it's all in 401k and pension plans. No, the largest section in retirement plan plan dollars is actually IRAs. Mm -hmm. So I love that like business dynamic. And then, um, it was kind of uncharted territory. There's companies out there. I was referring to them, but I didn't think they were doing a great job and I didn't think their team knew what the hell they were doing. And so I'm like, I could do it way better. Why am I continuing to send my clients over here and bang on my head against the wall for the crappy service and incompetent advice they're getting I'm just going to handle the accounts too and not just be the attorney. So that was, you know, that's the Reader's Digest version. <laughs> oh, that's the short and sweet of it. Um, but uh, I still, you know, even you said earlier, I still love self-directing. Like it's what I do with my own retirement account. Like my largest client has a $300 million plus Roth IRA. I have a couple other clients, $100 million plus Roth IRAs, lots in the tens of millions. But we have a lot of clients who just have 50 grand. <laughs> A hundred grand, but they're investing what they know. They love it. They care about their money. And these are the type of clients we like working with. But like, it's not very fun if you were at a job, like in the IRA industry, like us, and you're like, so which mutual fund do you want to buy? You know, that's not fun. But like, I get to talk to clients that like, I like, you know, just interesting deals. They're investing in a small business. I had a client invest in a Mexican soccer club, you know, with oh, his, wow. with his IRA. We have clients buy cattle. My partner, Mark Kohler, he's bought cattle with his health savings account, you know? I mean, I just buy like rental properties and do private money lending. It's pretty boring. Right, right. Keep it simple with it. <laughs> yeah, but it's like, it's, that's me. That's that's my style. And I get to do it how I want to do it. Mm-hmm. And so so I'm still super interested in it um, just because of the, the variety of stuff that people can do with it. Mm-hmm. Okay, Matt. If we can go back again. Um, yeah. Back, we go back to 2006, and you said that there's really no expert on this subject, right, at that yeah. time? Why do you think there was no expert? expert in that subject? Cause it seems like, you know, at any point there's always an expert somewhere. Yeah. It, did like, did the laws recently change with the self-directed IRA or like, um, was it, was it a newer product that, or something at the time? Like, what do you, why do you think there was no expert? It's a good question. One is I don't think anybody would figure out how to make money on it yet. Um, and two, the people that we're, we're figuring out how to make money didn't have a real business around it. They were always selling an investment. So okay. prior to this, everyone that was a quote unquote expert or trying to be was like, you can self-direct your IRA. So buy this thing, this investment offering I have. And mm-hmm. that was it. They weren't like a real neutral expert on the topic where I could be as an attorney. Um, yeah. There was a couple of attorneys working in the space for sure, but not for the in very, I mean, literally like five or less that were like literally going out and saying, I represent self-directed IRA investors that we're not like at a big Wall Street firm representing people with tons of dollars. So there's very few attorneys out there. So um, 
I don't, I don't know. I just think the, the industry has grown a lot since 2006 as well. So there's a lot more business opportunity now. I just, it was just ripe for the taking. So yeah. I did it. <laughs> yeah, no, and I can, I can completely respect that. Can you tell us, um, what was your thought process behind like wanting to write a book? Have you ever read a book, wrote a book yeah. before? Were you good at writing or is it just something you felt like you had to do? Did you get help? So I'll give the credit to my partner, Mark Kohler. So he's my partner in mm-hmm. our law firm, um, attorney yeah. CPA. He's written four books. All right. Thanks, Mark. Yeah. So, <laughs> but he, but at that point, I think he'd wrote two and he'd had pretty good success with it. And it was crazy. People would be like, oh, you wrote a book? We should definitely have you speak at this conference. They didn't sure, even right, care what yeah. book it was. It's good credibility for sure. Yeah, it's a credibility builder. At the time, I realized I want. I was looking for the book, like mm-hmm. Matt Sorensen, the attorney, trying to advise my clients. I'm like, hasn't someone wrote a book on this yet? Geez, no. And there's like crappy blogs back then about it and stuff. So um, there's actually one attorney in Texas that had done like a continuing education program for lawyers on it. That was actually pretty good. That was kind of like the only thing. So. I decided to just write the book and I write it for investors and their advisors. That's the subtitle of the book. So, um, but it turned out to be an awesome marketing strategy. One, cause I make money selling the book. Yep. You know, I make thousands of dollars every month selling the book. Yeah. You can't sell your business card. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and it's like marketing, like, like I'm that people who buy my book are highly likely to become a customer customer, either in my law firm or in directed IRA, Mm -hmm. because they're going to realize, oh, this is the person that knows all the questions I've been trying to figure out about this. So certainly his team's going to know this stuff. Um, But there's been a ton of other benefits from it. Just in the, my industry, it set me apart as an expert. Um, You know, when I go speak somewhere, I'll always have people to be like, I read your book. It's so, it's awesome. But I'll say this, it has to be a good book. Like a lot of people have done the you know, they kind of write a book that I, frankly, they have someone ghost, right? It's mm-hmm. not, there's not stuff in there. That's not in another book. They're stealing stuff from other places. Th- those books may have a place, but that's not what I was looking for. I really like burned a lot of weekends and nights writing my book, but it's paid off tremendously. Um, it's been a huge, huge benefit, but now like for, for now, I'll tell you one thing that I didn't anticipate was even my team at directed IRA, it is like the handbook here on what we let you do and don't and how they, how we learn. I mean, we have like training programs internally on it. So, um, so it's been super helpful to get everybody literally on the same page about how we operate. And it comes really from my book, which is quite complex. Our business is a little complex, I'll say. Um, and, and we get some people from industry, but a lot of people we take and we train them specifically in the space. So, um, been a lot of value there too. That's awesome. Um, the thing I love about the book, like you said, Matt, um, obviously it adds, cre- adds that credibility and, you know, those people end up being your customers because they know, like, and trust you because you're giving them value through your book Yeah. and because, you know, you're continuing in education and helping them succeed in the same space you have. Uh, it, it definitely, it creates a win-win for everybody. And I think that's really cool from a rookie investor. So I'm the rookie investor in the room here. Okay. Um, <laughs> and again, I've always had the, um, I've always had the the inkling of lending out money. So what I did of my investing adventure was I started out lending out of my HELOC. I've done a lot of partnerships with Nick. Um, obviously with that, I'm paying my HELOC fees and everything like that. What would be the benefit of someone like me switching over to a self-directed IRA or a 401k? So that's super common. People using a self-directed IRA or 401k to just do private money lending. Mm-hmm. Really? I think the benefit of it is to get better yield. I mean, obviously you have an expense on the HELOC, but most people that do private money lending in particular in the real estate space, they're rolling over dollars. So whereas you're looking at it from I'm doing it off a HELOC versus an IRA, a lot of people are looking at it. I have 200 grand in an IRA at TD Ameritrade in a mutual fund I don't even know or in a couple stocks or something. And I, I'm interested and I'm learning about real estate or I'm in the real estate space. I'd rather do private money lending on real estate and kind of play the bank. Um, and so for those people, I think it's, where do you think you're going to get a better yield, right? You already have retirement account dollars. Do you feel like mutual funds are going to make you more money or do you feel like you can make more money doing private money lending, um, getting interest and points of course on your dollars. So, um, that's the most common thing. What I always tell clients there is, you know, this is just general real estate. Somebody will 
be like, Matt, you said I could buy real estate with my IRA or I could lend money on real estate. I called TD Ameritrade. They said I can't do it. Well, your IRA at TD Ameritrade can't do it. That doesn't mean IRAs can't. You just need to move your IRA to a company like Directed IRA. Well, we'll let you do a real estate deal, invest in an LLC, buy a rental, flip a house, private money lend. And so you can do all those things in a retirement account. But for everybody, so even you from the HELOC or you know just someone in their mutual fund, I mean, IRAs, whether it's a self-directed IRA or your IRA at a broker dealer, mm-hmm. you know, one of the benefits of it is when you make money, you don't pay tax, right? And if it's a traditional IRA, it's growing, no tax. It doesn't come on your 1040. You're making money lending it. You're making money selling property. Doesn't matter. You flip up house. Doesn't matter. The gain goes back into the retirement account, no tax. It doesn't even show up on your 1040. In a traditional account, once you're at retirement, though, you got to start paying taxes. You pull the money out in traditional IRAs or traditional forecasts. But the Roth dollars grow and come out totally tax free. So a lot of people love Roth accounts. Some pros, there's some differences between the two. But um, so the, the huge tax benefits is one reason clients use their retirement account. Um, also, it's a it's a it's a long term wealth building strategy. So oh, like for you, what I might say, and this is for most of my clients, if they're a private money lender personally. My art, or they're, they are they invest in buy and hold rentals, or they do flips. My argument is stop doing it personally and start doing your retirement account. My my argument's always, and also do it in your retirement account. Yeah. Okay. So like me, I buy rental buy and hold rentals. Mm-hmm. I got a business, a lot of stuff going on. I'm, you know, I'm trying to run my do my day job, so to speak. I don't got time to chase down a flip. Frankly, to do short term private money loans unless they fall into my lap. Like just buy and hold rentals. That's my game easy, acquire it, just sit on it, build the cash flow, pay down the debt, hopefully appreciation goes up. So that's what I do with my retirement account. That's what I do personally, it's simple for me. But if you're a, somebody who flips properties, you're just private money, lending money, personally, do the same thing in your retirement account. Do what you're good at and what you know. Um, but the retirement account's your long-term wealth that you're sure. building for the long haul. Gotcha. So what makes what makes a Roth IRA tax free? Is it because the seed money goes in that that seed money was already initially taxed? Exactly. Yeah. So that was okay. the deal Congress said. The the original retirement accounts that came out were the what they call the traditional now, which is you put your money in, you get a tax deduction when you put your six thousand bucks in a year. It's now sixty five hundred in IRAs, and or the same thing with your four hundred one k. People have you know your day job or your solo four hundred one k. Put money in tradition, you get a tax deduction. Cover the, that's saving you taxes now, right? I get to reduce my income on my tax return now. But Congress is like, but you pay tax on the way out when you pull it out of retirement. The Roth, the deal was, and the Congress is so dumb, you know. <laughs> Quote <laughs> so, of the day, I love it. Yeah, that that might not be, uh, you know, surprising to some of you. Right? Yeah, no kidding. Um, but but on on the Roth stuff, they're so dumb because they're really pushing Roth accounts. There's this whole Rothification movement in D.C. They, they would rather everyone have Roth accounts than traditionals because Congress wants to spend your money now. So the deal that they have is, oh, you want to put money in a Roth? Well, we don't give you a tax deduction. That means you're paying more tax to the government now. They get to spend more of our dollars today. The elected Congress today is not looking down the road of all these Roth accounts growing and coming out tax-free later. <laughs> They're so yeah. short-sighted. But a lot of smart people are like, hey, I'll bypass that tux- tax deduction now. Let me get money in this Roth because it's going to grow and come out totally tax free. So like our clients have million plus accounts and I I say that as an example. We have lots of clients with 50,000, 100,000, you don't have to have a million dollar sure. account, but but you know, they're obviously super happy that they passed up tax deductions because they got these million dollar accounts that can come out totally tax free at retirement. But but even me, I got a mix of traditional and Roth dollars. Like I'm not all Roth cuz sometimes I was like I want some tax deductions. Sure, yeah. So <laughs> You got to min-max the strategy a little bit for sure. Yeah. I'm sure we'll get into this, but I just thought I'd bring it up now. Um, I invest in a lot of real estate as well, mostly residential. Uh, mo- mostly I do rentals, but I do have you know flip properties, some development. And I've had some people um, let me use their for, uh, sorry, not 401k, but uh, Roth IRA money. And um, I specifically what one of these partners, you know, they were told by their professional that they can't be on it at all. They can't be on the LLC. They can't control anything. They yeah. they just sent it that that money directly from their their holding company like Forge Trust. And I'm dealing directly with Forge Trust and my LLC and I'm trying to make returns for them. But, you know, after listening to some of your podcasts, it seems like they could have a little bit more control. 
if they wanted, right? Like, yeah, it sounds like they could have just created their own LLC um, and had the manager of that LLC be their IRA, unless I misheard that. And then they can have a little bit more control, right? Yeah. So there's different ways people can invest. So like, let's say you have the, the person that's just an investor and all they want to do is invest like someone in one of your deals and they want to just throw in some cash into your LLC or your company. Maybe it's a loan, maybe it's equity, doesn't matter, but, and it's going to come from their IRA custodians. So like Forge Trust is an IRA custodian, like directed yeah, trust. Yeah, custodian, like sorry. Yeah. So they're going to send the money to your company and that IRA is an, an investor in the deal, but they're not involved at all in it, right? Like they're right, just, not at all. you're running the deal, your name's on the company and everything, and, and you're out there doing what you do. Yeah, basically, they just wanted to see the um, they wanted to see the joint venture agreement that we had. They sent me a check, and then when I'm done with the project, I sent them a check back. Yeah, yeah, and so that's pretty straightforward. Um, notes are really common; just a private note, whether it's secured or unsecured. Obviously, from an investor standpoint, and it's on real estate, try to get it secured. But sure. <laughs> um, so the other um, out route, though, is if like you're a, you're a deal person, like. Like you're like, no, I want to use my retirement account to do deals, or I want to partner my retirement account with someone else. And I want to be involved in the deals from like a decision making, oversight, management role. You can do that. You just can't get compensated personally for it. Okay. So for example, you can one thing is an IRA LLC that's super common. Rather than your IRA owning real estate, you can have your IRA own an LLC one hundred percent, and the LLC can then go own real estate. And what will happen is that LLC will have a bank checking account. The IRA will invest its cash into the LLC business checking account. You can be manager of the LLC. The IRA is not manager. You personally can be manager of the LLC, but you can't take a salary. You can't work on the property. There's some rules and restrictions on that. We have lots of podcasts. Up, so there's chapters in my book. It's called an IRA LLC, checkbook IRA. But in that structure, it's kind of for people who want to do deals. Like you're buying property at the courthouse steps. You're doing a lot of short-term loans, you're rehabbing a property, right? You want more control. Maybe you want some asset protection from the LLC. But the nice thing about that is the LLC is going to be on title to the real estate. The LLC is going to be contracting with the subs or the general contractor. The mm -hmm. LLC is going to be doing all the deals and you're just acting as manager of the LLC. You don't own the LLC. You're just manager of the LLC, which means you can make decisions for the LLC, just like president of the corporation has authority for a corporation. Sure. So that's a very common structure that deal making clients do. So some clients are just like, no, nah, I'm going to invest in someone else's stuff. They don't mm -hmm. need to worry about that, but no, nah, I'm going to do deals. Okay. You can do an IRLC. Yeah. And, and for the audience out there listening, don't stop now listening to this podcast and go just set up your own LLC and start doing this. Because <laughs> there are going to be some, <laughs> yep, yep. There, there's a part two to this, right? Like yeah. it's got the, the operating agreement has to be set up correctly. Right. To include a lot of, you know, what, 20 different points or something like that that, that mm -hmm. have to specifically to do with the IRA um, language. Can you speak a little bit on that? Yeah, every IRA custodian, this is directed IRA or any of our competitors, um, you know, they're going to have a checklist that the LLC documents have to comply with. And your regular LLC that even your smart real estate attorney um, or you're doing it off legal Zoom, you're cracking it out wherever online those are not going to work. Those, I'm just telling you, those documents are going to get rejected. I literally made a living in my law firm before I started Directed IRA, taking all the rejected LLCs from all the custodians and fixing them to comply with the rules, which cost you double, by the way. You, mm -hmm. you know, pay to do it yourself. You waste all the time. And then sometimes I have to shut the whole dang thing down and, and start over. But um, So it's called an IRA LLC. The operating agreement's unique. The LLC has to be manager managed, can't be member managed. The EIN needs to be obtained in a unique way that you wouldn't do if an IRA wasn't involved. So every step, there's a couple of quirks to make sure it's done right. So, um, but we do it in our law firm, KKOS Lawyers. You can go to kkoslawyers.com. We're setting them up every day for clients across the country, whether you're using directed IRA or not. I mean, I don't know why you wouldn't, but, you know, so we're helping clients set those up. And it's $1,200. Bucks. Um, it's 1000 bucks if they're using directed IRA. So, but we see people paying 2500 bucks for these. You do not need to pay that much to have an IRA LLC. But it's also not the, you know, $100, I filed my articles online yep. <laughs> type thing either. And right. why won't you send money to this, you know? <laughs> <laughs> it's a perfectly set up corporation. Yeah. <laughs> but LegalZoom is only $400. <laughs> yeah. So you get to the end and you're like, oh, I need all these things. And then you're like, oh, it's actually $800. Um, but even the LegalZoom docs won't work. Sure. Yeah, okay. exactly. 
No, that's really interesting. Obviously, I mean, you're a lawyer and an attorney and everything, so what you guys are doing is kind of the law at that point, and it's better yeah. than what you said a legal Zoom paper can do. Yeah, and we're, you know, for lawyers too, and this is just because a lot of our competitors are not lawyers. It's crazy how many people, new real estate investors in particular, use people who are not lawyers, and they're like, they pur purport to be, and like, we'll set up your entities and do all this stuff. It's mm -hmm. not attorney-client privileged. Um, you know, which was what big thing of using a lawyer, like all your information's private and it can't be, you know, received in a lawsuit, but also, um, like we have malpractice insurance, you know, mm -hmm. like that's like, well, we are licensed by a governing agency. And so I think it's really important to make sure you're using an actual real professional, um, when you get into the legal space, you might pay a little more, um, just like a real doctor you pay more for too. Um, <laughs> That's so, a really good point. I love that. So, yeah. so Matt, if I if I could speak on behalf of the uh, the people that aren't an attorney like yourself, um, it can be a little intimidating not knowing who the right attorney is to speak to because most people, you know, when they think real estate attorney, yeah, they just think anybody who's kind of you know, they'll always go to the wrong attorney. It seems like at first, and that attorney's not afraid to give their advice. <laughs> in, in my experience, even if right, they yeah. don't know what they're talking about, um, so you got to really. In my experience, um, and I don't have much, you got to be really careful which attorney you speak to because they all there's so many different types of attorneys out there, just like there's different types of ages, yeah. different types of investors. Um, so if, if for some odd reason they wouldn't want to use you, what, what should they look for uh, language-wise if they're trying to find an attorney to help them with something like this? I would look for a law firm too. I mean, you don't just want like an individual lawyer. You know, that person, they... You know, you want to, like, if, if I, you know, Matt, real estate investor, this is not Matt lawyer. Like, you want a relationship, like, right? You're trying to build a portfolio. You want someone with you along the way. You're trying to build your team. Like, get the team. And so look at the law firms that represent clients like you. Like, even me, like, I go use lawyers outside of my own law firm for certain things that, so, but I look for, like, do they have the expertise? Do they represent companies like mine, you know? Um, and so if you're a small real estate investor, kind of like day job, part-time real estate investor, we have lots of those clients, maybe you're a real estate agent, real estate investor, real estate deal person. Real estate. I mean, find law firms that represent those. They're out there. You mm -hmm. know I mean? Our, that's our law firm goes heavily into that space and small business owners, like that's our niche really. And so find the, the, the kind of already has done this. Like, like the attorneys in our law firm have already had a thousand clients that have done what you've done, you know, and that learning curve is super helpful, but you're right with attorneys. A lot of people kind of work with who they know or who's close to them. Like, Oh, well, well I'm in Cincinnati. I better find a lawyer in Cincinnati. Why? You know? And then they get to their friend from college or their brother-in-law who does DUIs and divorces all day. You mm -hmm. know, they have no idea what they're talking about. The, the, the bozo that's not an attorney sitting in a cubicle in Nevada advising you, you know, that actually knows more. <laughs> Right. <laughs> yeah, I remember um, I was trying to buy uh, a well drilling company uh, about a year and a half ago. And the guy that was rep the attorney that was representing the seller, um, he was just a litigator, like he, he was not a business guy. And he was not afraid to help out. And he just I, I don't want to blame it on him, but he killed the deal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, he but, did. He you did. know, his the seller totally trusted this guy. And um, yeah. his mm -hmm. contracts were so sloppy. Um, and it was just, I just feel like you just got to be careful which attorney you're dealing with because the, everybody has their different specialties. Fine. I think just find one that's in your space that represents clients like you. That's the best. Um, that's even what I look for. Like I say, and finding own legal counsel for me is sometimes I have to go outside our firm. Um, and I think the most, the clients that we're best at helping are the clients that are just like our other clients. I love that. Um, real quick, I know, Matt, you and Nick both talked about uh, the prohibited transactions, so to say, that you can and yeah. can't do with an IRA. Uh, we kind of briefly touched on that, but obviously just hearing that, you know, your partner, Mark, he invests in cattle. And um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it, it, what can you invest in? Obviously, it sounds like you invest in biz business ventures, but can, you can't invest with something that has your own name on it or you're doing work. Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So... There's a few restrictions. So the first is like, what type of assets can your IRA not own? So like what's restricted as an investment asset? And that's really just S corporations, Okay. which is fine. You can do LLCs all day long, which is what we do, but you can't own an S corp. When your IRA is buying Microsoft stock or Amazon or whatever you're buying, like 
that's a C corporation, so it, you can own the stock, but IRAs just don't qualify as an S corporation shareholder. Okay, fine, use an LLC. The second thing is um, you can't invest in collectible items. So collectibles, you used to be able to buy them, like you could buy like art with your IRA or 401k back in the day. You could own a collectible car and people were doing this and totally abusing it. You know, yeah. I always oh, yeah. joke that people would buy wine collections that turned into bottle collections. <laughs> and so Congress had to come out and like restrict it. Cause these were like these quasi personal investment assets. They restricted collectibles. Um, and then life insurance, that's it. So, so really like everything's fair game. And when the real estate space, we have a client's buying from water rights to single family homes, to commercial properties, to hotels, to like everything, you know, you can think of, in the real estate space, clients have done um, small business, startups, private equity funds, venture capital funds, hedge funds, precious metals, crypto. I mean, those are all assets your IRA or 401k can own. So um, that's what we're doing every day here is, you know, processing those investments for people's accounts. So, um, but then the can't do like, so that's, those are the assets you can't buy. But the, the big rule is like, the restriction on what you can and can't transact with and do, which is called the prohibited transaction rules. So that rule says your IRA can't transact with you. So for example, if you owned a piece of real estate mm -hmm. that had appreciated significantly, you can't say, well, I'm going to sell it to my IRA, you know, for what I bought it for. And then I'll have my IRA sell it. So I pay no tax, right? Gotcha. Like Congress thought of that. They sure. knew you would do this. <laughs> and so they restricted you from buying or selling assets from your IRA to yourself or to companies you own. And they also restricted certain people in your family, like your spouse, kids, and parents. So you can't buy or sell assets between yourself and your retirement account. You also can't live or have use of assets your retirement account owns. So we always get clients who are like, I want to buy a rental for my kid going to college with my IRA. You can't do it. Like your kid can't stay there. You know, we have clients that own short-term rentals, like Airbnbs and stuff that are like, hey, I want to stay at my Airbnb. It's on the beach and, you know, it's rented 51 weeks of the year, but no one's staying at it this week. Can I stay at it? No, you can't have use of assets. It has to be held strictly for investment purposes. And then you can't work on it physically. You can see it and oversee things, but you can't work on it. So there are some rules to it. Um, I always tell clients you do need to learn the rules before you start self-directing, but it's not rocket science. It's more like a board game. Like you just need to learn the rules and read the rule book or play with someone that's done it before, before you start rolling the dice and playing the game. Like, and it's the same game over and over again. The rules are the same. So once you get over that little bit of a learning curve, um, it's pretty quick because most clients, if they're a real estate client, they just keep doing the same thing over and over and over again. They know the moves. They know how they got to do it. Now, I know we talked about the LLC quite a bit, but uh, how, yeah. what is the process of setting up like the actual self-directed IRA? Like, how does that work? Could you walk us through that like necessary steps or what you recommend? Yeah. So most people who are self-directing their retirement account are rolling over money. They already have an IRA or they got an old employer 401k and they want to move money over to do a real estate deal, let's say. It's kind of a three-step process. Step one is open up the account at a self-directed company like Directed IRA. You can go to directedira.com, open it up, e-sign, or you can set up a free call with one of our new account reps. So step one, you open up the self-directed IRA account. Because again, if you're a Fidelity or TD Ameritrade, they're broker dealers. They're going to make you buy stocks, bonds, and mutual funds. That's what they sell. They won't let you buy real estate unless you're an ultra high net worth client with 50 million or more. So you're stuck to the menu um, that they have at their institution. So step two is you got to move the money. So if you, if you have, let's say you have a traditional IRA at TD Ameritrade, well, that's going to be a traditional IRA over at directed IRA. And you're just going to transfer the money over, which is a transfer form you'll sign on our documents. And then we submit to TD Ameritrade or Fidelity or wherever your money's at. So step two is funding the account, which mostly happens for transfer or rollover. If you have an old employer 401k, you actually initiate it with the 401k company and say, hey, I got an IRA at Directed IRA. Send my money over there. It's not taxable. Just send the money. So IRAs we request, 401ks, the, the, the customer actually requests into the account. Then the third step is you got to invest it. And so we have investment authorization forms. You'll submit the documents for the investment. Let's say it's a private money loan. You'll give us the note and deed of trust or mortgage. The the lender um, on the note is going to be directed trust company, FBO, Nick Beverage IRA. You know, like that's the that's the owner, that's the lender on the note. It's mm -hmm. not, you know, Nick personally. Mm -hmm. You're not lending right. the money. It's your IRA. Okay, gotcha. cool. And and if somebody doesn't have a retirement account, 
right now. Mm-hmm. And yeah. If they just want to get started. Could, could they get started with you or do they have to go to Vanguard or something like that? Yeah, they can get started with us. So, you know, in, in an IRA, you can only put six, 6,500 bucks in a year now for 2023. So it takes a while to get money in there. Now, if you're self-employed, you can do what's called a solo 401k. We have a lot of clients that are self-employed, no employees, um, entrepreneurs. They don't, they, you know, they're real estate deal makers or whatever it is. Take like the real estate agent. That's the perfect one. We have lots of solo case, no employees. They're 1099. They got good income. They never came from a corporate place that had a retirement account or 401k. They're like, I got to get dollars in. Yep, that's me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I'm yeah. like, I'm listening. Yeah. So yeah. the solo case is perfect because you can drop sixty six thousand a year into it in new contributions. So like already in year one, you can start investing in real estate. Six thousand really? sixty five hundred bucks in an IRA. That's not going to get me very far unless I'm a really good investor. Maybe you can wholesale a property or do something with that. That yeah, your of returns money. better be about a thousand percent if you're looking to do that. Apparently. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you got to do really well. So, but I do have clients that. Do you know? Oh, yeah. Clients start with just six six thousand sixty five hundred bucks and have big accounts now. So, but the solo case cool. So, can we do a scenario then? So, yeah. somebody like me. Let's say I've got some cash. Let's say I've got. I don't have any retirement set up. Um, could I just put sixty grand into a, a solo four hundred one k and then roll that over into a Roth? Is that what you're saying? Or yeah. So in a solo k, you can do traditional or Roth, whatever you want. And so. Starting in 2023, and you can actually still make 2022 contributions right now and set up a solo K if you want to get money in for 2022 purposes. That's up until the tax return deadline plus extensions. Now, if you're an S Corp or something, which is usually what we recommend a lot of our self-employed clients be, um, you would have had to have had this on your payroll back in January. So it, sure. it can be a little clunky. Let me just say that. But there's a way to still get $2022 in if you're extending your tax returns. So just let me say that, but let's just say 2023. Okay. Just, you can run the math. So what we're going to look at, if you're an S corporation, which is the most common person that doesn't, does a solo K, they're already an S corporation is we're going to look at your W2. One of the tax strategies in S corp is to have your W2 as small as possible. Right. Um, Mm -hmm. But just, just stay with me here on this. This will help you understand how, how you can put money in. I'm staying with you. All right. Okay. Let's (laughs) say you made a hundred grand on your W2s. Okay, and I'm doing 100 grand so I can do the math easy. The way you put money in a solo K is, see, in a solo K, basically Congress has said, hey, you're self-employed. You don't have any employees. You are the employee and you're the, you're the owner of the business. So when you put money in a solo K, it's just like someone that works at Dunder Mifflin, you know? Like you put your employee contribution in mm-hmm. and Dunder Mifflin puts in a company contribution called the employer contribution. It just happens to be you're the same here. So the max employee contribution you can put is 22,500 for 2023. So if you made 22,500, you can put in 22,500. You made 100 grand employee contribution, you can put in 22,500. You made 10 grand, you can put in 10 grand. So like it's dollar for dollar whatever you make you can put in um, up to a max of 22,500. Now the employer can match up to 25% of whatever you made. So wow. if your okay. if your W2 was 100k they could put in 25% of that 25k. So they also get to put in 25k. So right there we're at 47,500. So if you made 100 grand, you can contribute 47,500. Um so that's how it works. Um it, there's a it's a combination of employee and employer contributions and starting in 2023 there was just changes in the laws that can 100% be Roth. You can do Roth on the whole thing. Okay. Well, could I ask you about my situation then? Yeah. Yeah. Might as well. Yeah. <laughs> Let's get um, your solo cake on, Nick. <laughs> Let's stop it. Yeah, All right, cool. All right, yeah well, we I mean, I, I suck at the retirement part. I mean, I've got rental houses, which I just consider that those are my retirements, you know, someday. I but, know. I know. Um, let's say, so last year, uh, as a W-2 employee of one of one of my main LLCs, I made twenty. I made 24 grand. That's what I've been making for the last five, okay. six years. That was the W-2 you took? Yep. That was the okay. W-2. And okay. then I made a lot more with other sources, you know, like, rental income, Okay. Uh, flip income, uh, commission, a couple hundred grand in commissions as a real estate agent. Yeah. Um, and it just kind of gets messy and my bookkeeper okay. and accountant kind of make it so that I barely pay any taxes anyway. Yeah. Well, you're a real estate professional like yeah. me. So, <laughs> so what's happening is 
And this this is int- this, you're just like a lot of our clients. And sorry to so, complicate it further, yeah. I did I did have a couple employees last year under that same Ooh. LLC. Okay. My, my wife was one of them. Okay, and then she's I, okay. I had that. an assistant for about half the year, and I I let her go. Okay, all right. This is a perfect example. Okay, so um, because we're gonna go through a number of rules here. So this is a solo four hundred one k. I'm gonna get into. So I hope you don't not, mind doing this. I love it. This is perfect. okay because we're gonna teach <laughs> a lot of the points that need to be known. All right. Um, let's make good use of our time here. Okay. So, so what, what's happening on your return and just so everybody knows is, and you know, this is good. You're sharing your, you know, yeah, I don't mind. It's a pretty open okay. book. Okay, cool. So at the end of the day, your W2 is 24 grand, but you made a lot more money than that. And why is that is because Nick is a real estate professional. So for tax purposes, I presume your losses on other properties, you got rentals, buy and hold stuff. It's coming and offsetting all this other income from flips yep. and, and things like that. And so when you get down to it, your taxable income is low. Now, that's awesome for cutting your check to the IRS at the end of the year, but it does limit how much you're going to be able to put in your solo K. But you're still going to be able to do a pretty decent contribution because if your W-2 is 24000 out of your own company, you're going to be able to put in twenty two five. Um, This is 2023 numbers. Um, plus... 25% of 24, which is 6,000 bucks, right? So, okay. um, so right there, you're able to put in 28 grand automatically. Now, if your spouse works in the business and takes a W-2, I don't know if your spouse, okay, and she gets a separate, does she get a W-2? She does, yeah, for okay. closer to 60 grand a year. Okay, okay, let's talk, okay. She can have an account in the solo K. Okay. So your business partners and spouses can participate in the solo K okay, and you can still do a solo K. Okay. So when I say solo K is meant for the business owner as long as you have no other employees, no other employees means like third-party employees, business partners that are owners in the business or spouses. Those are fair. You can have them in the solo K. So we can do a, a solo K separate account though because you got your retirement accounts and your spouse will have her accounts under the solo K. So your spouse, 60K, they can put in same 22,500. Again, this is 2023 numbers plus 25% of 60K which is 15,000. So right there, she's able to put in 37,500. So between the two of you, I mean, you guys are, can put in 65,500 bucks in, okay. in contributions off of those incomes. And you could choose whether that's Roth or traditional. Since you guys' taxable income was low because you got all the losses on your other real estate stuff, I would do Roth. You know, you probably don't have to chase more tax deductions. But you can get these dollars in, um, and I'd get them in as Roth dollars and do a Roth 401k account for you, Roth 401k account for your spouse. Um, now, you know, you have an account fee separate, so you have an account, she has an account. Just make sure you know that. Yep. <laughs> um, but that's what I do. Now, you mentioned a, an employee that's not there anymore. Now, if you ever have a full-time employee that's worked for you for at least a year, you have to offer the plan to them as long as they're 21 years or older. Okay. And then part-timers, I believe it's about two to three years. It, there's a new law on that that went into effect at the end of the year. Um, but right now it's a three-year window for part-time employees. Eventually it's going to get cut down to part-timers that have been with you for at least two years. You also have to offer the plan to. So just be careful if you're trying to keep the soul okay, um, adding any full-time employees that have worked for you for longer than a year, part-timers too. And what would you recommend um, to get that solo 401k? Is there, uh, would you guys be able to open that up or is that, is there? That's what we do. Yeah. Oh, okay. So yeah. you could do that as well. <laughs> yeah. All right. We so do you don't yeah. just deal with IRAs. Oh right. yeah. Yeah. We do solo Ks. I mean, IRAs are more popular because everyone can do an IRA, you know? Oh, yeah. I got an old employer 401k. I work in corporate America. Or I'm a business owner with employees, you know, just keeping the IRA. It's easy. But I'm, I'm telling you self, like I wish I could do a solo K. I can't, you know, I got employees. Um, but anybody self-employed with no employees other than partner or spouse, um, they should definitely do a solo K. So we set those up every day. So you, you can get going on it either at kkoslawyers.com or directed. We work on both parts. So the, the law firm does the plan documents. You have to actually have a 401k plan that's pre-approved with the IRS. We have a pre-approved plan. You can self-direct. You can do Roth accounts. It's, it's everything you'd ever want. And then we do the accounts for it at directed. So and it's just a solo 401k, solo 401k account. So you can start at either place. There's an intake on both websites. Um, or just schedule a call, too, with one of our new account reps at Directed, and they'll get you initiated on the process. Um, 
Yeah. And that's the solo case. So if anybody's like listening, is like, man, I'm kind of like Nick, like I got, I'm self-employed. Mm-hmm. Maybe my spouse is involved or I got a business partner, but I got no other employees. Solo K is like no brainer. The, the option you can do. Some people are like, well, I was told to do a SEP IRA. No, 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 no. For solo 401k is way better. You can put more money in on less income. You can loan money out to yourself from a solo 401k if you ever needed to. Um, there's so many perks to it over uh, an, a SEP IRA. So don't get confused and do the SEP IRA. Solo K is way better. Gotcha. Make it sounds so easy, Matt. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And we have a podcast episode on Solo K too. I got it's, there's a whole chapter in okay. my book, the self directed IRA handbook. There's a chapter in I'll send you a copy of the book, Nick. All right. Thanks, Matt. <laughs> yeah, All right, yeah. Jeremy, your turn. All right, finally. Yeah, I've been waiting. <laughs> All right, Jeremy, you want to consult now? <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. Just a really quick one for you, Matt. So real quick. It so, it's great content. It's great it is. Content. This is good. Is. Um, just a really it's quick good. one, obviously. So obviously Nick does a lot more real estate than I do, but I'm kind of dipping my toe in. Uh, I am self-employed too, so I own a couple businesses. One of them I'm 1099 on. One of them I'm just taking money from the business account. Could I still open an IRA or a 401k? Yes. Okay. So in order to do IRA, all you have to have is earned income. Okay, easy. So IRA, just earned income. You're good. Um, and in 401k, you just have to have a business. So if you have, um, any S corporation or you just do an, you use an LLC, LLC right now. Yep. LLC. Okay. Mm -hmm. As a rule of thumb is for any clients, you know, like if you're making 50 K or more net, we usually like you to use an S corporation. Now you can have your LLC taxes in S corporation. Um, you don't have to start over and do a new S corporation. You can just do LLC taxes, S corp, our tax lawyers can do it for you. It's not that complicated. So there's, that's a little side note there, but as to the retirement account, you don't have any other employees. Nope. You 1099 me. some people, but, or you get 1099. I'm 1099 through oh, one you of get, them. Yeah. Okay. You get 1099. What I would do, you know, even if you've got multiple different sources of income, if they're all like, like, let's say it's commission or consulting or, you know, whatever, it, it's not like investment income. Sure. If they're all like 1099 for basically work or consulting or commission, just have it go into one company. Okay. And then that one company, you've got all your expenses, you know, and, but then you could set up a solo K in that one company and then start making your contributions from the solo K in that company. Like Perfect. for example, I had, we have this client, he's just sometimes been on our, our lives and we, Mark and my partner, we do some lives and it's so funny. Cause he's like, can I run two businesses in one LLC? He's like, I have a landscaping business and a barber shop. Can I run them out of the same entity? I'm like, this guy cuts hair and grass. <laughs> He's like, the he likes to cut things. Like, I love it. Yeah, I was like, what? The? I'm like, yeah, you could run them in the same business. You know, you might do like a subsidiary thing if they're big with employees. But for a lot of our self-employed clients, even me, I have lots of different income. I have my own S corporation mm-hmm. that owns like my law firm interest, and I and it. And I receive a lot of separate income just into my S corp. I get a speaking fee, my book revenue, other consulting stuff I got. It goes into my own S corporation. So you can have multiple streams of income going in. And then it makes it easier to do just an S corp or sorry, a solo K out of that one entity. Okay. Very cool. And obviously, since you are the expert on this, what kind of deals do you like to invest with your accounts? Buy and hold rentals, okay. just because that's what I have time for. Mm-hmm. It's interesting because I had a client of mine, a friend, Josh McCallan, he has a podcast and um, he's always raising money. His company's accountable equity. And it was interesting. We, I had him on a webinar with me and I mean, he, you know, he buys like golf courses and he owns like a winery. And okay. you know, I don't know if you guys know the guy. He's, he's great, but yeah. um, sounds familiar. Yeah. But he's, so he's got a podcast called capital hacking. Okay. Um, but he made a really good point in a webinar that, that I, something I'd been thinking about, we articulated it well. Cause he was talking about investors and he's like, yeah, you can, he, and he was telling, I was talking to investors and he's like, you can make more money investing than, you know, like, let's say an investor in my fund, you can make 10%. Let's just say, I, that's not what he's saying, but I'm just giving an example. But it's like, oh, you can make double that if you actually ran the deal and found the deal and did all the work. But so, so there's some people out there that are like more deal maker and they're like, I can go find the deal and yeah, you're going to get a bigger return but you're giving up something. You're giving up your time. Do you have it? Do you have the expertise? I, I just don't have the time for it. So sure. I'm like buy and hold. Um, but I see, you know, from our clients, they're doing lots of other things. And and there's lots of different ways to be successful. I Lots of people ask like, hey, what are the people in, you know, doing that have the biggest accounts at Directed IRA? Mm-hmm. They're all different. <laughs> they're not sure. doing the same thing. <laughs> it's not like they all like stumbled into this one thing all of them are doing over and over. They're all doing something different. They're just really good at that thing that they do. Gotcha. Um, 
So I'm pretty boring. I'm like, I just tell people I'm a base hitter. You know? Yeah, yeah. It's like Moneyball. Moneyball, you know, you've seen that where it's uh-huh. like just get on just, base. Just mm-hmm. get on base. Don't you don't need yeah. to hit home runs. Um, and that's how you score runs at the end of the day. That's how mm-hmm. you win the game. I love it. All right. Speaking of getting on base, <laughs> um, <laughs> tell us if you don't mind, let's switch gears slightly. Let's talk about real estate if you don't mind, because we mostly talk about real estate and business and entrepreneurship here. Um, what what kind of investments do you prefer? I, it sounds like you know, simple long-term rental income, yeah. but, um, do you like single families, multifamily? What, what area of the country are you investing in? Do you invest in your own backyard? Um, can you get into that? Yes. So, um, I have invested in my own backyard. I'm in Phoenix. Mm-hmm. Um, I've invested in Utah, which is where I used to live too, but I stopped. Um, and, you know, maybe that was foolish, quite honestly, but I still did well. So sure. <laughs> I started investing in the Midwest. Even in my retirement account, I bought a, um, a rental property in Indianapolis. Well, I had a 300% return on that investment in five years. So it appreciated yeah. great. But the Phoenix and Utah markets appreciated great too. And I st- I've had other rentals there, buy and hold properties, but I stopped investing. And so, um, so I was at the time chasing cash flow. And, you know, I know a lot, this is where it gets super tricky because a lot of people are like cash flow is king, just chase cash flow. Cause you know, who cares what the real estate market's going up or down, you're going to cash flow your property, um, get in a place that has high rents compared to the cost of the property and operating and all that. Cool. I get that. I buy into that, but it's not always right. If I bought a property in Phoenix at the same time I bought in Indianapolis, the appreciation I would have had in Phoenix would have been insane. Sure. You know, and I've had it in my yeah. other properties that I already had here. And so one, one thing I've learned just personally in investing is there's different ways to make money. And sometimes different strategies work better. Like it's just you knowing, okay, am I chasing an appreciation strategy? Like, can I time it right? In Phoenix or like in certain markets like that, you've got to time it right. Even Utah has been crazy too. So, but I'm mostly buying single family, but I own some commercial like office stuff. Even the office, like I'm in a... 10 story office building that's condominium. It's the fourth floor we, I own with my partner, um, a suite down there. We own another, our office building in Utah. For any business owner that has a business, don't pay someone else rent. Own yeah. your own <laughs> office building. Why? Yep. Like, oh, and space. So, best um, advice ever, right there. Yeah, why not? <laughs> um, control your destiny too, because we've had clients that get really in tough positions with business locations they've established and they can't renew their lease and they get held hostage and they end up paying way more than they should. But I'm actually looking into doing some a little bit of private equity next. Um, that's what I'm sourcing right now in terms of deals. Um, that's been a super hot investment. And so um, I don't know. I'm, I'm interested in a lot of stuff. But I've, I've done kind of boring just real estate, a little single family, a little uh, commercial. But I think you do not just look in your own backyard. It's, it may be convenient, but um, find the markets that hit the appetite and the strategy you think works at the time you're investing. Yeah. So if I, if I can ask another question, um, what would be like maybe one big thing or maybe three um, things that you learned while growing such a large business over time? Um, obviously, you've been in this for a while. Yeah. Um, but, you know, looking back, what are some of the biggest misconceptions that maybe you had going into your business growing adventures that you've, you're starting to realize um, that that is now something that maybe if you had to do it all over again... <laughs> To maybe <laughs> yeah. not shortcut the process, but something yeah. that most people just don't realize until you get to the where you are. I'll say the most important lesson I've learned is um, you have to have an amazing team. It may sound simple, but I'm telling you, a lot of entrepreneurs and business owners think that they need to be the smartest person in the room. And if you're operating that way, you're going to be in a room with a lot of people you really shouldn't be at the end of the day. Um, you need to get people that can complement your weaknesses. And that's one thing I learned pretty quickly. I went and sought out some people with senior leadership roles within my company that complemented my weaknesses and um, filled in gaps where I, that I didn't have. Um, that as you're growing and scaling an organization, you know, I mean, we're hiring an employee a month, you know, mm-hmm. it's like eventually it's like, it's tough, you know, you got to really pay attention. And, but like, I, so get smart people that are great at what they do. Um, and, uh, find this, particularly the ones that complement your weaknesses. So it's all about, it's all about team. 
I'm just like, you can have the greatest idea in the world. It does not matter. You have to execute on it. It is all yeah. execution to me. Like self-directed IRAs, there's 30 other companies that do it. Why are we kicking all their butts right now? Is we execute. We just do it better, you know? And, but it's, so, uh, so that, that's one is just executing. And there's so much to that, by the mm-hmm. way. I mean, there's like, a <laughs> yeah, of course about, that, about how to execute and you have to have right strategy and right people and, um, so much to that. But the other thing is, and just today we're celebrating here at directed IRA, we've had 500 five-star reviews, you know, and, and one thing is keeping the client experience key and making sure your team knows that and like prioritizes that in their work. I mean, you've, we've all been a customer at a business that you can tell, like they really do not give a shit. Like they do not care about <laughs> you. And you feel that when you call or you get an email response, like, um, they try to make your life more complicated. They don't try to make it simple. It's like, I'm trying to do business with you and pay you, you know, like make it easy. <laughs> and I was like, we have a mantra here, like make it easy. Like that's like, we make self-directing easy is like our brand promise. And so if you can get your team to believe in that and like operate that way, your clients feel it, your team likes working more that way and that model anyways, but sometimes it's not natural. Sometimes people are like, let's reject that. You know, I mean, that's like, IRA custodian, like they rejected it. What they reject it for? They won't tell me. Well, how am I, am I supposed to know what to do? How do I get it processed? I just right. transferred all this money to you. I set up an account and paid you. I'm just telling you, our, our competitors do that all day long. <laughs> and it's yeah. like, you're, it's like, where's Waldo? You're like trying to figure out what did, what did I do wrong? What do I need to find? How do I do this? So we try to just be helpful and make it easy. Oh, I had one other thing I wanted to share though, because I was going to give you three. You asked for three. I got you. Did do, you did the three. So I, I'll recap. Okay. Um, okay. You got surround yourself with the right people. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. There's one, and then do things. <laughs> Two and <Okay>. three. <laughs> put out a quality product. Yeah. Yeah. That's pretty good. <laughs> but I mean, uh, yeah. that's uh, two. You know, two decades of what you've learned. I, that's pretty good. You know, yeah. keep it simple. But surround yourself with the right people, which can take a lot of time, a lot of trial and error. Um, I had my closer that was I thought was really good actually, and I'm like totally blanking. <laughs> I'm like struggling to figure it out. But yeah, those were good ones. I'll you know rest yeah, my yeah. case on those. Just, <laughs> just give us a call if you think about it. Yeah, yeah. We'll we'll put we'll, it in the show notes or we'll something. We'll re-record this whole <laughs> yeah, thing. Yeah. <laughs> no, this is this has been super awesome, Matt. I know we're yeah. getting close to the hour cutoff mark yeah, here for it's our Monday. show. He's got to get back to work. No, that's okay. But I do want to ask you just a couple real quick questions before we wind down and uh, send this uh, send this one out. So, uh, real quick, if you were given thirty million dollars gifted to one of your bank accounts, what's the first thing you would spend it on? Good question. Um. <laughs> <laughs> Not that I have $30 million, but I'm like, it's the same problem when you got a hundred thousand, a million. I mean, it's a little, little different, I guess, but I wouldn't put it in one thing. Let me say that it's Easy. a complex okay. answer. So you're the first person to refer to it as a problem. <laughs> <laughs> it is because I value money and the effort it takes to obtain sure. it. If the, I just know that 30 million is not going to hit my bank account because I just, you know, bought a lotto ticket, you know, like that would have been a lot of blood, sweat and tears for all of us to get it. So mm-hmm. I'm like, Phew. Um, but it would, it's fun to plan that. Um, so I, I would do a, a lot of different things, but, um, I probably do a little multifam, a little, little more multifamily. I'm already starting to do a little bit of that now. Um, that's, that's kind of going to be here forever type thing, not going anywhere. Um, but I, I do a lot of little things. I mean, I, I'm interested right now in real estate and doing, and just doing some infield lots and, um, in Phoenix right now, you can. There's a lot of areas where you can add and su- and just do a lot split and gotcha. get a, and two lots out of that um, in a mass scale. I don't know. There's a lot of private things. I'll just be honest. I don't yeah. want to do it. <laughs> <That's okay. laughs> but it it would be all in investing it. I mean, there's very sure. little. I, I don't live like a high lifestyle. I don't know that I change much of that. So sure. Um, but it'd all be investing it um, to grow and try to provide security. I'd probably yeah. do some charitable stuff with it. Sure, of um, course. I, I don't know. I would still show up to work the next day, too. Right. <laughs> yeah. You know? That wouldn't be the end-all, be-all of it, but you would. it would give you a little bit of comfort. And, you know, like you said, as investors, we would diversify that as as we needed when that yeah. time came, I think. so. Here's actually what I would do. Let me let me, say, let me give you a better answer. Because this is some of my clients. So like The client has a $300 million Roth IRA. Mm-hmm. At that level, you, you have to build a team that helps you to go invest it. And you got to first go and get known with someone that has a lot of money that can go do deals. Mm-hmm. That is key right there. Because if I'm out there just like 
hunting for deals, or I'm just buying retail investments, I'm wasting the opportunity of a large sum of money. What the, my, the most successful clients might have done is they are known with someone that has $30 million to invest in stuff. Mm -hmm. Now deals come to you. People come to you because they know this guy can cut a check tomorrow on a, on a big deal. And, and so that way you start almost being like the sh a shark in a shark tank where everyone just comes and presents their deals to you and you just pick which one you want to do yep. rather than you out hunting around with your hundred thousand dollars, trying to find the best way to get the largest return. So before I even start looking at what to do, you want to get known as someone that can invest, start getting in the circles. You'd actually want to build a little investment team with that 30 million. You're going to need a team to deploy it properly. Sure. So you do due diligence and get smart people. Um, you can't get too big of a team for 30 million, but, but that's actually what I would do first. Then you start finding the oppor the opportunities. And for me, they're all unique. I think they're going to they'd be a little unique depending on what's going on. That's mm -hmm. actually what I'd do. Awesome. Final smart, answer. Smart answer from a smart <laughs> attorney. I love it. Um, real quick, Matt, how do you define success? Being happy to wake up every day. Like that's, if you're, that's success, whatever you're doing, lots of people value different things in the world. It's different, but if you're waking up every day, happy and excited about what you're going to do, that's success. I love it. And when you're not investing, what are you doing with your free time? I like to mountain bike and ski. Okay. So I'm usually riding my road bike or mountain bike, skiing with my wife. Nice. Um, hanging out with my family, my kids. I love it. Good stuff. Uh, last question for you, Matt. Where can people find out more about you? So me, you can get to mattsorensen.com. Pretty simple, but that's Matt with one T and Sorensen with an E-N. So <laughs> M-A-T-S-O-R-E-N-S-C-N.com. You can Google me. Pretty easy to find. Um, all the social places. You can connect with me on Instagram. On my Subscribe to my YouTube channel, Matt Sorensen. I'm also Matt Sorensen on uh, Instagram and, and Facebook. LinkedIn as well. I, I'm pretty heavy on LinkedIn. So, but um, the companies, if you want to get into self-directing or you want to buy real estate with an IRA, you want to raise capital, you know, um, get, you can get over to directedira.com, schedule an appointment with one of our new account reps, okay. and they can go through the different account options and setups, whether it's a solo K, an IRA, HSA, you can self-direct all those accounts into real estate or other alternative assets. Awesome. Um, that's great, Matt. Yeah, definitely. Thank you so much. Um, Nick, anything you'd like to add? Well, I just subscribed to your YouTube channel. So thank you. Appreciate welcome. that. Yeah. For those listening, you better subscribe to ours here. <laughs> <laughs> Get go. on both of them. I nice. love it. Get um, on. No, yeah. we'll, we'll put all of Matt's information in the show notes when the episode yeah. airs too. So all your links, just uh, click it below and uh, get you in touch with Matt and his teams. So uh, Matt, thanks so much again for joining yeah, us today you. on the investing in the investor shed. We, we really appreciate your time. This has been a really cool conversation. Um, Nick, you want to take us out? Yeah, no, I appreciate it, Matt. I think this is the year that I might actually open a retirement account. It's thanks to you. <laughs> right. Okay. Well, it's my honor. Let us know where we can help. All thanks, right. Jeremy. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Thanks everyone. We'll see you. We'll see you next week. Bye. Thank you so much for checking out the Investor Shed podcast. If you enjoyed your time, make sure to leave a five-star rating and review on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. Follow along on YouTube, TikTok, and Instagram at The Investor Shed for shorts and promos about each episode. Do you want to be a guest or know someone who has great real estate investing advice and stories? Reach out to us at theinvestorshed at gmail.com.